no, it's, it's, I mean, that, this actually does transition well. Across the globe, from Chile to Chicago, Lebanon, Iraq, I, definitely in 2018 in the Sudan, in Sudan, certainly in Haiti, Ecuador. Okay, all of these places have their particularities. There's a Catalonia. There's different contexts, obviously. But this is a really dynamic global uprising, and it really does share a very specific focus on austerity and neoliberalism to the point where specifically, I would say, in, you know, in places like Iraq and in Lebanon, they're taking precise aim at the sort of sectarian systems and saying, look, right. I don't care about this. You can't, as an example, tax WhatsApp. You have used the language specifically in the past, Crystal, of a global working class uprising as well as the challenges of delivering on left-wing populism. When you look at this, I mean, what are your takeaways from watching this emerge right now? Yeah, and look, I don't wanna oversimplify because like you said, there are different dynamics at play in all of these places. But when you look from country to country, and when you look just at the sheer number and massive scale of the uprisings happening around the globe, and I love that you included Chicago and Definitely. what's happening with the teachers movement right here at home, you can't help but realize that the neoliberal world order put in place by the United States of America has completely failed and people are calling bullshit. And so whether it's, you know, attacks on WhatsApp whether it's a fair hike, whether it's a gasoline tax, whatever it is that's the final spark, um, people are just, they're just done and they're taking matters into their own hands. I mean, Chile is particularly interesting, I think, because you had this country that was like held up as the model of, you know, the sort of neoliberal wealthy model. Um, but underneath that, you had some horrible inequality. You know, you had people who were really struggling to make it where day-to-day -day life just was filled with pressure after pressure. Um, and, you know, very similar dynamic to what we see here where the rich are getting richer and everybody else is just screwed with wage stagnation and um, high cost of education. Um, they have a highly privatized country. Um, and of course, you know, our fingerprints are all over um, what's happened in their politics, not to mention, of course, Iraq, not to mention Lebanon with the, right. the number of Syrian refugees they've had to take in. So so in any case, um, you know, it's remarkable to see w the common threads that are there. And at the same time, it's like complete silence in our media. I mean, even with the teachers movement that's happened here, that's the largest labor uprising that we've had, you know, certainly in our lifetime. And it's never treated like that. I mean, they might do a story here or there on this individual um, strike or this individual, you know, movement, but it's never tied together as a cohesive set of um, demands and the, the kind of national, um, national movement that it really truly is. Because it doesn't have, for one thing, it, it's hard to tie it into like a Trump is bad story, which is like, you know, it's hard to make it into either a Trump is good or Trump is bad story, which is basically all the media really wants to focus on right now. Um, and it's also inconvenient, right? It's inconvenient to look at, at West Virginia or Kentucky and see that there's a solidarity there between, you know, them and Chicago and Oakland, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense with the narrative that the media is set up, they truly just can't wrap their heads around it. And then with the uprisings around the globe, like it's very obvious why that wouldn't get coverage by the media. It's incredibly inconvenient. Um, as I just said, because the U S's fingerprints are all over, you know, these countries and have in many cases very directly impacted the uprisings that are happening right now. And there's just not a convenient narrative around it. Yeah, I was thinking back yeah. um, when I was first getting into media, it was the, the Arab Spring. And every time there was a new uprising, media was all over it because there was a convenient narrative around it. First of all, there was this, all this like techno optimism. Oh, Facebook and oh, like social media is making the world amazing. Right. right, right so there yeah. was that. 
But then it also fit into this very convenient narrative about like, oh, you know, people are choosing democracy and like we were right, you know, like we were right to come in and say, here's how you should change your countries. And so it kind of fit into that lane as well. Whereas with these uprisings, global working class power, um, you know, a rejection of the neoliberal system that's been the status quo that these media organizations are very much um, bought into and, and oftentimes their consumers support as well that doesn't work so well yeah 100 percent. and just I, we're going to play this later but there one of the chants that people are saying in chile is and it's i don't know how this translates in spanish but i'm sure it sounds better than it does in english but the point they're they're chanting that basically neoliberalism was born here and it's going to die here right like specifically wow, chile is <laughs> ground zero well i mean yeah right like you have the 73 CIA-backed coup, and then it becomes a laboratory. All the Chicago guys go there. I mean, that's that's the what's getting synchronized with the Pinochet mass killings. And I think another symptom, like you were saying about these convenient narratives, like Chile transitioned to democracy in such a way that all of the old power and wealth and market relationships were not changed. So you still have mm -hmm. decades of formal democracy. And that, I guess that's like the like, yeah, the media is obsessed with Trump and it doesn't fit a convenient narrative. But also it's like this is the only answer to Trump and they're missing it. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's it's I, I don't know if you've had a chance to read Matt Taibbi's book on media criticism yet. Hey, Dink. But um I think he lays this out better than anyone. He says, basically, after 2016, remember there was all this, like, soul searching in the media. Oh, my God. Like, what did we do to cause this, right? Mm -hmm. And he said their analysis was basically to go from a million hours of Trump to a million hours of Trump is bad, right? Right. Like, it's not been any different. And, of course, it's not any different. I mean, it's the same business model. So what's what's going to, as long as they have the same business model, it's not going to change. But that's, that's really the bottom line. And so look, people love getting titillated by the squabble of the day. And I don't want to say that none of that, the stuff isn't important, right? Whatever happened with impeachment today and all, I, I don't want to minimize it and act like it's not important. Trump is the leader of the free world. Um, and so his statements matter, his actions matter. That's all important. But you can't sit by and say Trump is a symptom and then not cover what the actual problem is, let alone the other symptoms that we see unfolding here and around the globe. So, you know, CNN has a great international footprint. They have all the resources and everything that they could possibly want to really be on top of this story, which is in my mind, it's just so clear that this is our, the story of the moment, the story of what's really happening and the massive shifts that are underway that could go in really horrible dystopian directions or could be channeled in really positive um, transformational ways. But it's, it doesn't have a convenient villain. It's not a sort of simple narrative enough. And so um, it doesn't serve the bottom line. Right. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.